right. Thanks a lot again for the organization. Um, so here's a little bit of a reminder of things we have done yesterday. Um, we consider the so-called local law that I'm going to write in a minute. Uh, for this is stated about the green function evaluated in the domain D. And D can go up to the scale, almost up to the microscopic scale. Um, in namely, we look at the imaginary part of Z at most, at least, n to the minus 1 plus epsilon, right? So this is my green function. The Stilges transform is always uh, defined in this way. And um, one nice fact about the Stilges transform is that when you take the imaginary part, this is, depending on the eta, this is a way to smooth the empirical spectral measure. And you smooth it on a scale eta, given by a Cauchy law, around the energy level E that you consider. For Z, my notation would always be E plus I eta. OK. <coughs> um, so this is why this is a, a nice object we want to consider. Uh, G satisfies um, a short complement formula that we explained yesterday. And as a corollary of this short complement, we see that S is not far from the fixed point of this equation, which is a quadratic e uh, equation. We saw that M, the solution of this equation, is nothing but the Stilges transform of the semicircle law. Uh, so if S satisfies the same equation up to a very small error by stability type of estimates, we will have a very good estimate on S. Um, another thing that I'm going to use today is that G um, is very conveniently um, differentiated with respect to the entries of the matrix. Um, so you, if you derive your, um, with respect to, say, the entry ij, and you want to consider the entry uh, gkl, then you have this type of formula. So you're going to get minus gki uh, gjl plus g. A J G I L. So this is something you can check. Okay? And this is when uh, I and J are different. Well, on the diagonal, you have the same similar type of, of formulas. But you have a calculus like this that you can really use it conveniently. Okay? Um, so what the local law tells you, and uh, this is a result of Erdos, um, Yao, and Yen. is that in, indeed S is very close to M. So uniformly in, the, in this domain D, you have S of Z minus M of Z. We satisfy an excellent estimate just of order atmos, 1 over in eta. Let me remind you that this notation means that it's uh, dominated by N to the epsilon times this factor for any positive epsilon. OK, with absolutely overwhelming probability. And um, this is an excellent estimate when you take the trace. If you look at the individual entries of the matrix, you have a slightly deteriorated estimate, but still a good one, which allows you to identify the leading order of the entries, which is um, the following type, gij still at z minus delta ij m of z. This is of order at most the square root of the imaginary part of m divided by an eta plus 1 over n eta. OK. Um, so if you are in the bulk, you need to think about this estimate as being dominated by the first term. And the imaginary part in the bulk is nothing but basically the density of states. So this is order 1. So that's the 1 over square root anita, which dominates the 1 over anita in D. Okay. So this is a first um, reminder. Uh, we had two corollaries about it. So corollary 1 is um, the fact that eigenvectors are delocalized. So my notation for eigenvectors is always going to be u1 Un n. 
and um, the supernorm of UK is of order at most 1 over square root n. And uh, by the way, I think yesterday in the proof, it was mentioned to me I did a small mistake by a factor n. So I will not tell the mistake, but find it. Okay. Um, and uh, the corollary too. Um, the corollary too is the fact that the lambda i's are very close to the quantiles. So my notation for the quantiles is that um, up to gamma k uh, the integral of my semicircle distribution is k over n or let's say k minus one half for symmetry. And um, we have lambda k which is distant from gamma k with factor at most n to the minus two third, uh, k hat to the minus one third. Remember that my k hat is um, the distance to the edge. Okay. So this is uh, the first thing I, um, I wanted to remind you. Um, so now we, we change uh, the topic slightly, uh, going to dynamics. <coughs> So let's say dynamics for universality. And this is an ID by Erdos, Schlein, and Yao. Then it was declined in a variety of forms uh, from a technical perspective, but the idea of using dynamics for general investment distributor goes back to this work. Um, and um, we consider the dyson brown motion. Um, namely, we start with a matrix H0, which I'm going to choose to be a generalized Wigner matrix. And dht is dbt over square root n minus one half of ht dt. So it's strictly speaking not a Brian motion, but the Orstein Nunberg version of it. So my notation for b here is a matrix which is symmetric, and each entry uh, follows a standard Brian motion. And on the diagonal, we have a slightly different normalization. It's BII over square root 2, which is a standard Brown motion. Remember, this factor square root 2 was uh, designed so that you keep the orthogonal um, invariance by orthogonal conjugacy. So this process is also invariant by orthogonal conjugacy. And all of these Brown motions in the upper triangle are independent. So let's say a little bit about the scales here with this square root n. This square root n is such that after time of order one, you have an entry of like a Gaussian over square root n, uh, which is exactly the equilibrium measure. And it means that for time much greater than one, you already reach equilibrium. So you have a, a, a GOE. with extremely good accuracy. Okay, because the Orstein and Beck, when it goes to infinity, converges to Gaussian very, very fast. Okay. Um, so in particular, for t much greater than one, it's so close to GOE that the local statistics can be identified. Okay. Um, but the question is, uh, can we run this process a bit shorter time? so that uh, actually we already reached local equilibrium. This is certainly not true for any statistics of the matrix, but it may be true for the gaps or for the tracy with them. Um, but before going to that, we will first prove that uh, the local statistics for 
uh, Wigner matrices at the starting point has not changed up to some time. So I'm, I'm not going to dyson brown motion in terms of uh, evolution of eigenvalues right now. I want first to uh, mention the following fact. Let's call it a lemma. Um, pick some epsilon. So the first part, part of, of the lemma is that for t, which goes up to n to the one half minus epsilon, minus one half minus epsilon, uh, the local statistics in the bulk have not changed. So um, for any bulk index k, Um, and you take some, some nice f, uh, this infinity with compact support. The expectation of f of uh, your um, rho sc of uh, lambda k this is all at time t. My eigenvalues depend on t now. So this is basically the same as at time zero. Okay. Plus a small of. Okay. So it's clear that if you wait a little bit of time, uh, just a tiny germ of time, things have not really changed. Okay. But what this tells you is that you can actually go up to this time. In the book. Okay. N times the, the level spaces? The level uh, yeah, because my scaling is that this is of order 1 over n. Yeah. Um, and uh, at the edge, at the edge, you can prove that you can go to much shorter, much longer, longer time. Um, let's take. Um, You can go up to time one, actually, not, not even n to the minus epsilon, at least uh, up to time one. The expectation of your functional for um, n to the two-third So this is uh, my Tracy with them uh, type of scale. This is the same thing at time zero. smaller of one. Okay. So actually I must say I put one here, but I, I even can put an n to the epsilon. So sorry about it. You can put an n to the epsilon. It will not make a great difference, but a little bit I want to emphasize at some point. Um, uh, there, is, uh, there exists a small epsilon, so that this is all correct. And, uh, and um, let epsilon be uh, any small constant smaller than some epsilon zero. For some epsilon zero. Okay. How, well. is it, how, does this, uh, how is this consistent with the mixing of the first thing and that? You just, said, you just said up there that if you go to greater than one, this is... Yeah, that's the whole mystery. So, um, so if you look at the entries, in fact, for, for time n to the epsilon, you already have a Gaussian. Okay. Uh, what I tell you here is that nothing has changed. So actually, if you believe this, you already have universality. You just already have it at the edge because you can go up to some time. It's clear that if you choose n to the epsilon, your matrix is so close to the GOE that it's tracy with them at the edge. But on the other hand, nothing has changed. So end of proof, which is true okay. for tracy with them, not for the bulk. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> are you saying that the, for each realization, the eigenvalues, uh, or almost every realization, the, the edge eigenvalues do not move? So no. 
it's different. I need to integrate on the initial value, so that's the trick. I need to have a generalized Wigner at the start. Of course, if you start with something which has no tracy with them at the edge, when given this gap, this cannot be true. My expectations here are over everything, including H0. OK, so let's understand why this is true. Uh, and uh, this will give us uh, the proof for the edge universality. Uh, I mean, uh, so, so you're saying that it does not move, so you are trusting with them, but if you let the time evolve, then things change. I mean, uh, even, even if you start from uh, already uh, Gaussian, Gaussian guys, it's a dynamic, so the trust is with OK, imagine you, you start with the GOE. Yes, so you have trust with them. This is just constant in time. Ah, because you make the expectation there. Okay. Ah, distribution. Uh, okay, the distribution does not change. Okay. Um, so um, let's 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 sketch the proof. Um, so here is a here is a fact. which you can prove as an exercise. Maybe it will be part of the exercises on, on Thursday. Um, so I will, I will comment on, on whether my condition is generalized Wigner or Wigner a little bit later. Okay. So um, if you have um, F so if you define m to be the supremum over the following, the following guys, i smaller than j, s between ze time 0 and time t, and some theta, which I will define in a, in a minute, of my hij uh, at time s um, times square root n, plus the same thing. multiply by the third derivative with respect to hij of some function f. So f, again, is just a nice function here. Okay, C infinity with compact support. Uh, so you look at the supremum of this guy. And um, then the expectation of f your matrix HT is the same as at time zero plus a big O of uh, T um, square root N times M. Okay, so what is T da? is defined um, in the following way. You have your big matrix H and you're going to change only the entry IJ. So this theta actually depends on IJ. So you define theta in the following manner for, um, oh, but I, I have no theta here, so it doesn't make sense. It's, uh, it's for um, F at theta J. Sorry, it's, uh, there's not much space here. At, at the matrix theta H, which I'm going to define. So this theta h, the entry kl is going to be just hkl if kl is not ij. And it's going to be some number theta times hij with theta between 0 and 1. Um, so let's call it um, um, uh, u. Otherwise. So in other words, you, you first pick ij, and then you change only the entry ij, and it's symmetric, uh, into something uh, multiplied by a factor between 0 and 1. Okay? So this is reminiscent of some type of Taylor expansion, obviously. Okay. Um, now, 
how do you prove such things? It has nothing to do with uh, random matrix theory. Okay. Uh, you just have this collection of H's, which are your, your random variables. Uh, you apply your Ito formula to F of HT. But in the Ito formula, then you're going to change the HIJ entry into zero so that you decouple ex uh, expectations that can be split. You have a cost which is given by the Taylor expansion. And from there, you just calculate things and you will end up with this. You make a Taylor expansion up to order three and, you, and you're done. Okay. Any function, yeah, that's right. Okay. So, um, so nothing mysterious here. Um, how can you apply to it to, to, to these types of, uh, of things? So, first of all, I need to mention that um, this fact requires, and that's important, that the expectation of the Hij square is equal to constant in time, in time s. Because I do a, a Taylor expansion at order three, and these terms, are, they will cancel in some way. Okay, but uh, this is a, uh, where, what I wanted to say about Wigner versus generalized Wigner. Okay. Remember, my generalized Wigner has any type of variance profile, just the sum is one on one line. So in particular, the variance entries are not going to be constant. So please just cross this, it's for Wigner. Okay, because this lemma applies to Wigner, and this one will also apply to Wigner. We will see a trick after to go to generalized Wigner. So this is for Wigner matrix. So now, how do you apply this for, for this type of lemma? Well, uh, you want to apply it, for example, uh, let's say, let's say for point one. Okay, let, let's just calculate. So it's not clear how you access the gaps from the Stitches transform, for example. If I tell you I know the Stitches transform everywhere, how do you get the gap? Mm. It's quite technical, and I will not enter into this. So what I will prove is not that the gaps are invariant, but the Stitches transform is invariant. But it will happen to be enough by some kind of local control integral argument, and you can access a gap from the Stitches transform locally, especially because we have rigidity. We know where the gaps were, are going to be. Okay. So apply. One uh, for Stilges. Only. Okay. Um, so I want to calculate my derivative in time of the expectation of my um, one over n trace of one over. Uh, hs minus z and uh, I'm interested in um, local statistics so I want my z to be now microscopic so z is equal to e plus i and not an eta in my domain d but an eta slightly smaller n to the minus one and e in the bulk
So um, for this, I just need to calculate, for example, the derivative of GKK. S. Right. So my functional f is just gkk, so I need to calculate the third derivative with respect to the entries, and that's it. Let's try to, if we have a good bound on the, st on the third derivative of gkk, we are done, and this is exactly what the local loop gives you. It gives you some uh, very good stability results. Okay. So, um, now you can apply the formula I just erased that if you derive with respect to hij three times your gkk, you will get something of this type. You're going to get some uh, gka, gab, uh, g. Um, B, um, oh sorry, I, I should write it as um, GKA, B, C, C, D. So uh, I derive three times, I end up with four terms, D, E, and um, I finish with K. And if I derive one times, I have a minus sign. If I derive two, three, three times, I will also have a minus sign. And that's the sum over all A, B, C, D, such that I want my set A, B, oh, I did, what I did is completely terrible, D, E, and uh, F, I guess, yes, let's write it this way. And I want my A, B to be coinciding with I, J, my um, CD to coincide with IJ or JI as well, and EF the same. So this is a sum over, uh, so I want AB to be IJ, and the same for uh, CD and EF. Okay, so you have such a formula. Okay. Um, now, the sum is a finite sum, actually, because for i and j given, you, ju you just have a finite sum. So if I can bound any single term by a quantity of order 1, then my third derivative will be of order 1. What is, uh, what is inside, my, uh, just after my sup, I have h times square root n, but we know it's an order 1 quantity, because h is a random variable divided by square root n. Same for the cube, order 1. So m will be of order 1 if I can prove all of this is order 1. Okay, but if m is order one because I have a t um, square root n there, I end up exactly with my lemma point one because I have a t. Uh, I can go up to n to the minus one have minus epsilon. Okay. So um, so if g uh, if all of the, if any of these g's is of order one, we are done. Of, let's say of order n to the n to the um, of order one, we are done. Okay. Uh, the problem is that the local law gives you g in the mesoscopic scale, but here my g is exactly on the microscopic one. So how do you understand g, uh, size order of g in a slightly smaller scale from the bigger scale? In general, this is not something possible. Um, but there are many ways to understand that G first satisfies some Lipschitz estimates, even when you get to, to, uh, to, the, to the real line. But these Lipschitz estimates, of course, deteriorate. But it doesn't matter because you have an estimate and at, at, uh, up to n to the minus 1 plus epsilon. So you may lose a factor n to the 10 epsilon when you go on a smaller scale. But it doesn't matter. It's just an epsilon. It's 10 times epsilon. So this is maybe not order one, but it's of order n to the 10 epsilon. But by the end of the day, by changing your epsilons, you are done for any epsilon. It works. Okay. So um, 
from a practical point of view, uh, how do you actually really prove something like uh, a good bound on G on a smaller scale? You use the following fact, the imaginary part of G of at E plus I eta, you can prove that it's smaller. So I take some eta which is smaller than eta tilde, microscopic scale and mesoscopic one. And uh, you just lose a factor eta tilde over eta. So this is just a deterministic inequality. Um, this you can prove, just an exercise. It's a, it's, a, it's a property of the function x squared over x squared plus one. Okay. Um, so you only lose a factor n to the epsilon, to epsilon, and, and then you are done. Okay. So is is the sketch of the proof somehow clear to everyone? Okay. The main I, I hope the main ideas are clear. Yeah, that's a matrix. Oh, uh, I, I put G, sorry, it's, that's a trace. That's my stigious transform I wanted to, to mention. Yeah, it's, not, it's only true for the, for the trace, it's not true for the matrix. Okay. So, um, so in the bulk, it's pretty clear what happens. At the edge, it's a bit of a mess to do the whole calculation, I would not do it here. But what happens at the edge is because the scaling is bigger, the microscopic scale is also bigger, you actually gain many more factors. So you can go up to time much, much greater. And it happens that time one is possible. Okay. So uh, the proof of edge universality is just over. So let me just write it. But, uh, So proof of edge universality. So you, you pick your t to be n to the epsilon. You know that the expectation of f of your uh, gap minus um, this is the same as time zero, essentially. But on the other hand, for such a large t, this is the expectation for GOE of the same thing. plus some exponentially small term. Uh, because all entries are so close to a Gaussian distribution, you are, you are done. Okay. So from a technical perspective, to prove this, you, you can just say your matrix is now a Gaussian plus a tiny perturbation. But for Hermitian operators, we know that we have perturbation estimates that so that if it's really tiny, this guy has not moved. Yeah. Okay. So um, <coughs> it's a bit hard to believe such things works, but I encourage you to actually do the calculation 4.2 based on the lemma. Okay. Uh, now 4.1, it looks much more complicated. But there is first a, a, a point I would like to say about point two. So let's keep talking about the edge, but for generalized Wigner now. Yes? Are you going to say something about how to ban these terms, these G, G terms? How to ban which term? The, 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 in the sum, this products of Gs. Oh yeah, so uh, that's all. For, that's all. 
I, 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 um, I explained it for the trace. For the trace, if you have a good estimate on mesoscopic scale, you get a slightly deteriorated estimate on the microscopic one, but you only lose a factor n to the 10 epsilon, which is fine. You don't have such an inequality for all matrix elements, but you can use different types of arguments. Uh, you have li just Lipschitz. The fact that it's Lipschitz is enough, essentially. Okay. And with some constant, Lipschitz constant, and you're, and you're fine. It seems, still seems like you're not saying anything. So let's say something. <laughs> If you calculate, let's take your very one G, D, E, at Z. Okay. Okay. So you, you agree that this one can be written, you derive in G. This is 1 over H minus Z, essentially, one entry of it. So you're going to be able to write this guy as a sums of products of two Gs. Okay. So the derivative in Z satisfies some bounds because G satisfies some bounds, okay, on the mesoscopic scale. So if you start with the mesoscopic scale, you, you have some bound on a slightly smaller scale, right. and so on. But you only, you only lose a factor n to the 10 epsilon, say, along this process. Because you can start at any mesoscopic scale, which is almost microscopic. Anyways. We, are, we are just playing with, with the n to the epsilon factors here, but because my, my estimates are are so good, it, it, here it doesn't matter. So the actual size of these Gs is, 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 is small enough, or is it just an average? Uh, so each G, so you can, what you can prove is that for T, for eta equal 1 over n, my microscopic scale, each, each one, G, D, E of Z, you will be able to prove it's of order n to the 10 epsilon and this is at most with overwhelming probability. So remember, on mesoscopic scales, I have much better. It's order one. But when I go to the microscopic one, I don't lose much. I only lose a factor n to the. And why is it okay not to lose much? Right? It's okay not to lose much because then all of these guys will be n to the hundred epsilon. Okay. Okay. N to the hundred epsilon. And then, um, where are we here? But this epsilon is arbitrary. So this epsilon here does not have to be related to the epsilon there. So you choose one to be a one over a thousand of the other, and, and you are done. OK? So uh, I, I hope it's a bit more convincing. OK. okay. So, um, so what about generalized Wigner? Now, I'm considering these dynamics here. Why did I consider the dynamics? Because it preserves the variance. And when I do this lemma, I need the variance to be constant. OK? Because remember, my h0 is, is Wigner, so the variance is 1 over n from the, start, from the starting point. Now, if I start with generalized Wigner, I have a problem. I cannot apply the lemma. But I can change the dynamics. OK? I can change it by, instead of having my 1 over my uh, 1 over square root n here, I could choose the square root of Sij, which is the variance. And then it will also preserve the variance. Okay, So everything would go through. And what would we get by the end of the day? We would get that this at time t is the same as this at time 0. The problem is that this is not GOE at all anymore. It's a Gaussian matrix with entries which are, don't have the same variance. But we don't know Tracy Widom for these things a priori. So, so it's a problem. So we want one more argument to conclude for generalized Wigner matrices to, to, to get beyond this uh, constraint of having the same variance. Okay. Um, so how do you do that? Now you really go to the dynamics Tyson Brown motion in terms of eigenvalues. Okay. So um, remember that my I order my eigenvalues along, along the dynamics. And um, you have, um, you still consider this dynamics here. So dht, 
is dBt over square root n. Um, Um, so, I, so I still consider this one. Okay. And now I want to see what is the induced dynamics on eigenvalues. So um, theorem. So if you consider the following stochastic differential equation, uh, let's say uh, dx k of t is uh, dbk, let's call it dbk k tilde t over square root n plus 1 over n 1 over xk minus xl minus 1 half of xk okay so these are this is an equation you can consider. Now, is there a solution? Uh, what, is, what are its properties? So that's what, what we're going to say here. So there exists a unique strong solution. Uh, that, so yeah, that, there are. So um, strong solution. And x as a vector, as a process, is equal in distribution at lam as l to lambda as a process. Okay. So in other words, when you look at eigenvalues, it satisfies these dynamics. So. I will um, be a bit sketchy. Like to specify the process in the initial condition for the x. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I um, if I yeah, you're right. If I want this equality low, I need the initial conditions to match. So x zero. It's lambda zero. Thank you. Um, So here is a, the sketch of proof. So imagine you can apply it to formula in a blind way to your eigenvalues as a function as a, of a matrix. Um, then you need the perturbation, the classical, say, Hadamard perturbation formulas for how does the eigenvalue change when you change the entries of a Hermitian matrix. Okay. So what, what is known is uh, if I define, define f dot as a uh, derivative with respect to one matrix entry of a function f, so this dot depends on i and j. Um, then um, lambda k dot is going to be uh, h dot conjugated with uk. And lambda k dot dot is going to be well, uk star h dot dot k plus the sum where l different from k of um, h dot u k star u l divided by lambda k minus lambda l. Okay, so exercise. All right, just prove this. How do you prove such things? Well, uh, do it just in the physics way. You, you just write what the eigenvalues and eigenvectors mean and differentiate. And then you are in terms and you will end up with this. Okay? And it strongly uses uh, the fact that it's uh, 
diagonalizable in an orthonormal matrix. So if you if you just use this, uh, no, no, they show up along the derivation, but at some point you will get some uk dot dot uk, but you know the norm of uk is preserved, and yeah. actually if so the derivative of eigenvectors is going to show up when you consider the 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 Ito formula for eigenvectors. Uh, which was something we will see um, on Friday. So, um, so once you have this, you can agree that you can blindly apply Ito. And what you will end up is this B tilde is not exactly B, but it's B conjugated by UK. So apply Ito. and just get equation one. With uh, B tilde T as a matrix, which is defined as the integral between zero and T of U T star, my um, eigenbasis, DB, uh, US star, DBS, US. So it's kind of enrolling your Brown motion with the eigen basis. But by we know from Levy, its characterization of Gaussian uh, vectors, that this will also be a Brown motion because this is an autonomous basis. You, you, you have to do the calculation to convince yourself about it. But this, if you define this, this is a Brown motion a matrix Brown motion by Levy. Why matrix and PTK is a scalar? Uh, this is my matrix here. I mean, uh, any single entry, this is an equality of matrices. So uh, US stars as my all eigenbasis at time S. OK. So you have this equation. Now, does, is this really legal, what we have done here? Um, not really, because you, you only can differentiate or apply it though if you know you don't have multiplicities of eigenvalues. You, you want to be in a smooth domain. Okay? Um, um, so you need something to justify that you will not have a collision of eigenvalues. So this, is, can, this can be made rigorous. provided that if I, if I define tau epsilon the first time, um, so that there exists i different from j with lambda i s minus lambda j s equal epsilon, if you define this first time, then as epsilon goes to zero, this, uh, uh, as t goes, uh, that's the first time, as epsilon goes to zero, tau epsilon goes to infinity. Yeah, I was going to that. <laughs> so uh, I assume I, st I don't. You don't need to because you, you run your dynamics why do you need to start the dynamics at time zero? You can start it as a, a, a small germ of time. If you, if, even if you have a discrete matrix first, if you just make a tiny convolution with Gaussian, you almost surely you already have different eigenvalues. So that's really not a problem. So strictly speaking, uh, Nicola is completely right. I need to start with different eigenvalues. Just a question about the DT. Is there as a matrix, is a diagonal or not? No. So it's symmetric, but not diagonal. Uh, oh, oh, I understand the confusion. Uh, no, I don't understand the confusion. So uh, this DB really is a matrix here, right? That's my evolution of uh, HT. And it, it is not yeah. diagonal. But B tilde K is the diagonal. Oh, B tilde K is, is uh, the KK entry of B tilde. And uh, my notation for B tilde K, that's a 
KK entry as we see that. Okay. Um, okay. So how do you prove this? Uh, anyone has an argument, just a, a, a one sentence argument for when you look at these dynamics, it will never collide. Just just a one sentence argument. Which is not rigorous but convincing. <coughs> Okay, yeah, you, 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 you can find a Bessel process behind it, but if you really want to check the indices of the Bessel processes to make sure it will not touch zero, uh, it requires a bit more, just uh, even shorter. You, if you believe that at least up to the first time it touches, it describes the eigenvalue evolution of your matrix. So remember the codimension argument in the first class? The codimension of eigenvalues coinciding, this is a codimension two. So if you have a Brown motion in your space, which is of dimension n times n plus one over two, is it gonna touch a, a, a subspace of dimension this minus two? Well, no, and typically not. Um, so this can be made rigorous and it's just clear. Um, but on the other hand, uh, we want to go a bit beyond that. I would like to add a parameter beta to go to beta ensembles. And I would like to argue that only for beta greater or equal to, two, to one, it's true that it will not collide. So what I just said about the codimension argument can be made rigorous and that's fine. Uh, but, but let's have an alternative proof. So as far as I know, uh, the, the very first proof of two uh, was given by McKean uh, as an exercise in his, uh, in his book, uh, in one of his books, I forgot which one. Um, so let's rewrite this equation is in a slightly different manner by uh, in a Langevin type by identifying this as a derivative of a Lyapunov type of a function. So the good way to do this is um, so one can be written in the following way. So I just can write it in this way, derivative in xk, sorry, where my xk is, uh, where my phi is the following function. So that's my uh, minus one by n. the one uh, half, so it's one quarter, my x k squared, so sum of x k. Okay, so everyone agrees with these types of, of writings, okay? Um, now, let's look at the evolution of phi along the dynamics. And uh, we will find out that it's very close to being a super martingale. And the only fact that it's a super martingale implies that there will be no collision. So just a calculation. Uh, 
my uh, DeFi. Um, is equal to some martingale term, some uh, local martingale term. Uh, actually, uh, it's really it's really a martingale term. Plus a drift, which is of the following type. Um, it will be one half minus the sum of uh, lambda k square uh, plus n over 2 and minus 1 over 2. But the key is the drift has no singularities. So why this phi is nice? That if you apply it to, look at the drift, you will have a lot of mini cancellations. Okay, the cancellations being due to the log factor and because the log factor will, will, will make you appear some 1 over lambda k, 1 over xk minus xl. But if you put two, two of them together, they will, they will vanish. And uh, you end up with something with no singularity. So that's an exercise. So in particular, so this is your sum of lambda k square. So come on, you, your lambda k, you don't expect them to get extremely big, right? It would, be, it would be weird to have one eigenvalue that gets extremely big. So let's just discard this fact for now. So, so we can say that this is bounded by a constant. And uh, if it's bounded by a constant, um, then um, if, you, if you just look at uh, phi plus a constant times t, this will be a super martingale. <coughs> yes, I don't care about the ends here. I just want to prove a qualitative thing about my process. Can I see? <laughs> so. so, if you if you define your um, so if you define t k the 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 first time such that there exists uh, so this k is a is a big k uh, there exists a lambda j greater than k. So before tk, I can bind my sum of lambda k square. Um, then if you look at your phi, but stopped at tk and at t epsilon, and you add a constant, oh, actually, uh, well, just for the sake of concreteness, you remove a positive constant times your t this is at time t. If you remove a large constant depending on k, then this is a super martingale. Okay. This constant depends on k and n. Okay. And maybe, yeah, that's it. Um, so what does that mean? So the expectation at a uh, large time is going to be smaller than the expectation time zero. But this is my phi, so the expectation at time zero is going to be um, plus a constant, sorry times cn of k is going to be smaller than my expectation phi at my time t. But what the, now let's, let's do one step back. 
what does that mean? You have t and t, t epsilon and tau k. If two eigenvalues get extremely close together, what happens to phi? Well, uh, where is my phi? Here it is. So it, it just gets very big. <coughs> my epsilon is small. So this is basically getting extremely big if two eigenvalues get close together. Okay? So it will just contradict this. So this needs to tell you something about the probability that two eigenvalues get close together before time t. It gives you something. And this something when epsilon goes to, uh, when t goes to infinity, you <coughs> just conclude what you want. Okay. Um, so from there, conclude exercise. You could have a quantitative power of epsilon to an extent? That's true, but it would be a bad one. It would be a bad one. But it's true. Um, So strictly speaking, you will conclude that um, tau epsilon goes to infinity as epsilon goes to zero. Not exactly tau epsilon, tau epsilon and tau k. So you need to deal with this tau k. You need also to prove that tau k goes to infinity as k goes to infinity. But this one is completely obvious because tau k is what? That's the trace. That's the sum of the, your lambda k square. So that's the trace of h square. So that's the sum of n square Brown motions whatever estimate you have on base cell or binary motions would be enough. Okay. So, um, is, is the ID clear here? The key is you get a good constellation so that there is no singularity there. So you can exhibit a super Martingale and that contradicts the fact that two eigenvalues can get very close. Okay. So just one comment. If I Imagine I put a beta here of color. Yeah, so what if I put a beta here? What if I change my process? Okay. So what you will find out about the drift is that it has the following form. It has a f it, it will have a singularity now. It will have a singularity with a one over beta minus one. 1 over n, the so sum of 1 over lambda k minus lambda l square. It's a calculation. So 1 over beta minus 1 factors the sum of the inverse squares of all distances. So in particular, only for beta greater than 1, this will have the good sign, so that you can still exhibit a super Martingale. And in fact, it's wrong. If beta is smaller than 1, there will be collisions but this is harder to prove. Okay. So our, our matrix and co-dimension argument is kind of critical. Okay, so I have about half more hour, I guess. Right? So now, how, how do you use Brian motion for university purpose? Okay. Um, nothing to do with this. So it's a coupling argument. So Dyson Brian motion. So um, the very first proofs of universality, thanks to Brian Motion, um, by Ardoschlein and Yao, were using some hydrodynamic and entropy types of, of arguments. Um, it was related to Bakriamari estimates and uh, um, a whole field of knowledge, which is completely different from what I'm going to explain here. Uh, this argument by coupling um, is probably somehow uh, more just easier for, for probabilists and it gives um, universality in a, in a strong sense. Namely, you don't need to average your own spectrum to have universality. So uh, here is a coupling. So um, let me state the theorem first. So 
So now let H0 be really um, a generalized Wigner. And let's talk about the bulk first. For t, a time greater than n to the minus 1 plus epsilon, my expectation of f of ht, um, so my, my functional in question, I, I really want to look at the gap. So uh, rho semicircle at lambda k, t times lambda k plus 1, lambda kt, this quantity is equal to the same one as for g o e. plus a small error term. Okay. And the analog for uh, the edge is that you need a longer time to get local relaxation. Instead of time 1 over n, you need time n to the minus 1 third. So, so we proved already uh, universality for the edge. We haven't proved yet universality for the bulk. And you told us that for linear matrices, you can go up to 1 over square root n, basically. And there you said that already 1 over n is sufficient to. Yeah, so these are different statements. One of them compares what happens after time t after what happens at time 0. The other one compares what happens at time t with time infinity. Yes. So what will be important for us is that there is an overlap. Okay. Um, and the subtlety here is that I'm talking both about generalized Wigner and Wigner. So for Wigner matrices, we already proved edge universality, and you don't need the dynamics of eigenvalues for that. Only the dynamics of the matrix as a matrix are enough. But for generalized Wigner, we have not proved edge universality yet, and this will be important. It's something like this. Imagine you, you know the central limit theorem, but only when all your, um, your, your um, random variables have the same variance. Well, it happens that you can prove central limit theorem by Lindbergh method, for example, um, even when the variances may vary. Why? Because you know that the central limit theorem is true for the Gaussians with different variances because of the nice property of convolutions of Gaussians. Uh, but we don't know that for random matrices. There is only one model for which we know how to calculate things for random matrices. Okay, so that's one. So to prove just universality in the bulk for Wigner, not, not generalized Wigner. So actually, we will prove it for generalized Wigner. Uh, but so it's clear that uh, if you accept um, this theorem here, the crossed one, um, you, have, you already have university for Wigner. Now, for generalized Wigner, it's pretty easy because generalized Wigner, all entries have, have size at least 1 over n times a small constant. So you always can realize such a matrix as another one plus an evolution of a diagonal motion. Okay. So, um, so I, I will write this a little bit later. So uh, 
<laughs> most importantly, I want to, uh, to give you just the ID for this by coupling. So proof ID. So here is, here is uh, how you, proce you proceed. You, you're going to consider, um, so here we know that lambda 0 as a vector at time 0 is Wigner, or generalized Wigner. Let's introduce another initial condition. Let's call it uh, y0. being a GOE. Assume you start with the eigenvalue of a GOE. So independent and GOE. And now you will run the dyson brown motion dynamics for these two different initial conditions, but for the same Brian motions. And we are able to couple this because we proved that there is, there is a strong solution. So what do you get? I just write these things. So you know that dx, d lambda k, let's just rewrite it. That's db tilde k t. What's over then? Um, plus one over n. But I run the same dynamics for y. So all of these depend on t. Right? So I can just subtract, and my bra motions goes out. And I end up with a classical uh, differential equation type of thing for the difference. Okay, so if I defined delta k t to be, um, so I need an exponential t over 2 times um, yk minus lambda k. So what is the equation for, so what you get is just that the partial derivative in time of your delta k, after taking the difference, is equal to 1 over n sum of delta l minus delta k t, t divided by the product of my lambda k minus lambda l times yk minus yl. So uh, notice that I put an exponential t here. That's in order to get rid of my Orsheim-Nunberg term in the equation I obtain. Okay. So it's a nice parabolic equation, which is not non-local, but smoothing. So in particular, what this means is that for t equal infinity, all of these delta k's are going to be equal. So let's, let's just reasoning, make a reasoning for t equal infinity first. All delta k's are equal means in particular that delta k plus 1 is equal to delta k. So I cannot really take t equal infinity because I have an exponential. So uh, for t large, Uh, 
uh, you have delta k plus 1 equal delta k. Plus a very small error thanks to the smoothing. But um, if delta k plus 1 is equal to delta k, look at the difference this is. You reorganize the terms. It means that the gap for one of them is equal to the gap for the other ensemble. So now it will be about understanding the time scales. Uh, but it's clear that coupling argument, if it has a smoothing effect like this, is one tool for universality. Okay. In coupling, you're saying that you use the same realization of the morning motion? Yes. So you, you can make a drawing, you can make a simulation, and you will find out that these trajectories keep oscillating, of course, in the long run, but they will oscillate together after some time. Um, so let's understand the time scales. So there are, there are different levels of rigor here that I can use. Um, first, let's, let's assume in this equation, I only keep the nearest neighbors in my sum over L different from K. If I only keep the nearest neighbors, and I assume that these lambda Ks are sticking to their typical location, just to understand the scale. If they stick to the, um, the nearest neighbor, it's going to be size 1 over N in the bulk. Another 1 over n, 1 over n squared here, with plus 1 over n, so I have a n times the discrete Laplacian. So if, if we just keep um, L equal k plus or minus 1, and we assume um, that lambda k at time t is always equal to gamma k, which is obviously completely wrong, but by rigidity we know it's not too far. Then my equation, let's call it 3, uh, looks like a discrete Laplacian 1. This is approximately in the bulk. Yes. It's it's you know look at look at this theorem uh, for t of order greater than one over n, this dynamics relax. This cannot be true for any initial condition. If you have a big gap in your spectrum or things like this, it will just be wrong, obviously. But if you have a sufficiently spread out spectrum initially, it will be true. Um, so um, what, you, what you end up with is derivative in time of this delta k. t is something like n times the discrete Laplacian applied at delta at k. Now, um, how, how fast does this go? If you don't have a n, you have an initial condition no matter what. You need to wait time infinity for things to get flat. But if you speed the, 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 the smoothing by a factor n, you need to wait time 1 over n, which is explaining the scale here. OK, nothing, nothing more. Now, um, let's talk about the edge here. If you assume lambda k equal gamma k, but you assume the edge now, so the edge uh, gap is going to be n to the minus 2 third. So you may think, OK, it's n to the minus 2 third. 
So it's n to the minus 4 third. So n to the 4 third divided by n. So it's n to the 1 third. OK, but it really means that the time of relaxation is n to the minus 1 third, which is uh, what is explained. I erased it. That's very unfortunate. OK. So uh, for, for the edge. OK, let, let me conclude first for the bulk. This suggests complete smoothing after t much greater than 1 over n. And for the bulk, for the, for the, uh, for the edge, sorry, after t much greater than n to the minus 1. So now, uh, what do you need to do to make this rigorous? Well, um, a lot. Um, the problem is there is a general theory, of course, about uh, parabolic equations, even in the non-local setting. But having very singular coefficients like this, which even though they will not cross, may get extremely close, uh, this is not really taken into account into most, most theories. Um, so the real fact is when they get very close, actually the smoothing should be faster, right? However, the general techniques uh, that are in the literature uh, don't really allow the coefficients to explode above. Um, so initially, Erdos and Yao derived a method to uh, deal with these equations, which was uh, inspired by the, the Georgi Nash Moser theory of parabolic <coughs> equations. Um, and it was uh, quite challenging. And what we will see is that there is a, an easier argument to make this uh, rigorous with a maximum principle. So um, here I gave you the first step, uh, but you let, let's try to go to another level of rigor. Let's let's assume now it's not um, it's not local. Let, let's skip the non-locality, but let's um, but let's still assume that we stick to the typical location. So if not local. Um, sorry. Keep the non-locality. And for simplicity, let's say that gamma k is just k over n. We, you have a picket fence type of. Then the equation becomes d over dt of your delta k from t. So that's the sum of the factor n. Okay, you, you obtain this equation. So let's try to, so this is a discrete space equation. Let's try to look at the continuous space analog. some ft of x is equal to the integral of ft of y minus ft of x, y minus x square, 
ui, let's say it's on r. And um, then we will talk about the factors a bit later on. But this is just a prototype for my continuous space uh, analog. So what is, a heat, what is a fundamental solution for this equation? It's a translation invariant equation. So if you're in Fourier space, you actually should be able to solve it. In the ID, after time t, what it looks like. So, so you, you, you start with a Dirac at E and, and then propagate, but in a non-local way. In particular, it will propagate pretty fast. You will be able to have a non-negligible mass far pretty fast. So what is hmm, prototype of distribution like this? It's a Cauchy. Okay. So the fundamental solution is Cauchy. In particular, so the kernel will be as follows. Just a Cauchy type of distribution, and the smaller t, the closer to a Dirac. Okay. Um, so why do I mention this? Because we will study eigenvectors on Friday, and it happens that the same equation will occur. And the fact that it propagates so fast like a Cauchy will have some impact on our understanding of eigenvectors of random matrices. Um, now, I think it's a good time to stop. Um, I will, so what I will do next time is to give one rigorous proof of the theorem of relaxation, not in the bulk, the bulk is just too hard, uh, but at the edge. At the edge, there is an easy argument to prove that after time more than n to the minus one third, you really get tracy with. And after that, we will go to eigenvectors and look at uh, why this is some object important to understand to go beyond mean field models. Okay, that's it. Any question? Yes. yes. What, what do you mean that you will give a rigorous proof? It seems that you will have given like two. Uh, so here I gave heuristics, right? Okay. So uh, so I, I assume that my lambda k sticks to gamma k. Okay. It's, it's just hard to control, to make rigorous the assertion that I can approximate my equation by another equation where I change the coefficients. This is an homogenization type of statement. You have an equation with random coefficients. You want to approximate it with one with deterministic ones. Um, there is a whole theory for this. And most of the time, the coefficients are bounded. You have some ellipticity and so on. Here, it, it may just explode. It, it's just hard to control. So we need to find something rigorous. And, and there is one simple observable we can create, which will, at the edge, make it very, very, very easy. In the bulk, it's just harder. Any other vigorous question? Okay. Ah, sorry. No, it's a, it's a stupid question. What do you mean by there is no singularity in, in your moving your uh, argument? I mean that in the drift, you mean for, for the proof that uh, in eigenvalues will not collide? Uh, in the drift, uh, I had uh, a function of the lambda case, which is smooth in the lambda case. Remember that when, when I told you if beta is different from 1, you have this extra factor, 1 over the sum of the inverse of distances between the lambda case, which is singular. Okay, So it just makes it harder to control. Okay, so let's thank Paul again.